This episode of the Stardom Cast is sponsored by Puro TV, your one-stop shop for all your Puro DVD needs. From Stardom to New Japan, from All Japan to Ice Ribbon, as well as incredible box sets documenting the best matches of your favourite Japanese wrestling icons, Puro TV has it covered with new items added every week. And now, as a special gift to listeners of the Stardom Cast, Puro TV are offering 10% off. Simply go to puro-tv.com, use the promo code STARDOMCAST at checkout and get 10% off your entire order. Once again, that's the code STARDOMCAST to receive 10% off your entire order. The link to their website is in the podcast description. And now, on with the episode. Hey, this is Kevin Kelly and you are listening to the Stardomcast. Stardomcast, your weekly audio source of all things World Wonder Ring Stardom. I'm your host, Rob Good, and I'm joined as ever by Independent Wrestling's Matt Turner. Matt, did you have a lovely Easter weekend? I did, brother. I had a phenomenal uh, Easter, and I'm still on a little Easter break. I added to, I had four days off from work, which was nice, and I figured, you know, I really don't take much time off. I really don't use my days. So I'm like, I'm going to add to it. So I'm on day five of my Easter break. And uh, boy, howdy, did I get a lot done? (laughs) As I've told you (laughs) all the crazy things that I've been doing, because I've just, you know, I'm I'm like a zoomie. Once my feet hit the ground, uh, when I wake up in the morning, I'm 100 miles an hour. So it was nice to uh, get a little bit breather. You're not going 100 miles an hour, only going maybe 70, 75. I was nice, really uh, overeating, eating a lot of uh, chocolate peanut butter eggs that I'm still eating, which was nice because I had to do a lot of extra cardio this week to burn <laughs> off all those calories. But you no, know, it was always nice to be around family, always nice to have time off, always nice to, uh, you know, kind of relax and recharge the batteries a little bit. How about you? How about you, my friend? How was your Easter break? Yeah, not too bad. I, I've said this before, like we've been um, in America during Easter and I don't know whether it's a cultural thing or or what, but I think Easter is a lot bigger deal in America than it is in the UK. And I might be speaking from not a non-religious standpoint, but someone who doesn't go to church and things like that. Um, There just doesn't seem to be as much um, around Easter in, uh, in Britain as there is in the US. But, you know, it was, the weather was nice. Um, me and Gersie went to Manchester on the Saturday, which was lovely. Had a nice mooch round, looked in some museums, um, got, um, stranded on a couple of trains, which was fun. Um, yeah, it, it was, it was a good weekend. And then yesterday we went out and ate steak. So, uh, you know, you, you can't go wrong without steak. Now, Matt, I do actually have a, a massive apology and I felt like, I want I, I wanted to do this on the podcast so that everyone oh. uh, so that everyone sort of felt my shame and uh, to the surprise of no one I was late to uh, to the recording of this podcast um, not my usual like twenty minutes half an hour late but still late and uh, I feel I owe you an explanation Matt uh, because I'm so. I'm ashamed of myself um, uh oh now we don't tend to watch trashy TV in uh, in our house. Um, we pride ourselves on, you know, watching hard hitting things like Netflix documentaries and things like that. We don't tend to watch trashy TV. Um, that was until Kirsty's boss, um, uttered the phrase married at first sight Australia, um, which Kirsty then instantly got addicted to. Um, so of course I did the responsible thing and mocked her incessantly for watching, what I perceive to be a ridiculous program um, and a waste of her time. So sure enough, a couple of days later, 
I'm now hooked on it and I needed to see what happened to this couple. And I was like, I can't go upstairs yet. I need to know what's happened. And for those unaware of the concept of married at first sight, it is quite literally what it says on the tin. It is two people who've never met who then get married and then drama proceeds to unfold. And that that is not something that I should watch. That's not something that anyone should watch. However, I found myself not only watching it, but bloody enjoying it. So at some point during this podcast, there is every op- there's every possibility that Kirsty may come in through the door in order to tell me what has happened to my favourite bloke in this show. And yes, that's how invested I am. I have a favourite person. Matt, what is wrong with me? Nothing but for you never have to apologize to me, good sir. As I know, as we as we pre-record, I took a little jab in jest. You're like, I apologize. I'm like, don't, I'm just teasing you. You never have to apologize to me, good sir. But uh sometimes you watch shows that are quote unquote a train wreck. And as my dad would say, sometimes you learn from people what to do and what not to do. Like, so you're watching that show, like, yeah, I'm just gonna do the complete opposite. But uh one, I'm excited that we might have a cameo from your girlfriend on the show. First, it's a possible I'm just I'm gonna completely lose focus uh on on uh, what we're gonna do today because I'm excited we might have a cameo but hey you know that's nice that you and Kirsty can share something um you know get, getting your tv time and i know poor amber and i know Kirsty as well they probably put up through so much wrestling so <laughs> much wrestling so there is shows that i have to watch that that when me and amber first got married geez it'll be 11 years god bless her uh it'll be 11 years in june she hasn't stabbed me yet not that i know of, but uh and the shows that i've liked like you know I, I watched a little bit of the big bang theory i never got into it um, we just started. Well, I never really got into Friends in the '90s when I was in high school, just because the '90s was such a crazy time for pro wrestling. That, to the shock of absolutely nobody listening to this podcast, that a hundred percent of my free time was invested in the uh, the Monday Night Wars and all the phenomenal wrestling going on in Japan. So we just really, uh, you know, she told me growing up when she was in high school, she watched Friends. So we really just got into watching the reruns just a couple years ago. The Office, uh, of course, the U.S. Office. Uh, just because I grew up literally five minutes outside of Scranton. So a lot of like their little jimmers and jabs, they talk about going to the Steamtown Mall. That was the mall I hung out with and and whatnot. Plus, it's a great show. So, um, you know, she got into that a couple years ago. So that's nice that now the two of you have a show to watch together, regardless of what it is, my friend. So now I know <laughs> that if you're late for anything or if I text you and it takes you more than five minutes to respond, that that's now I know what is what is going to now I know the I know the reason folks now i know the reason and i can rest my head very uh you know uh very uh, unwary tonight so <laughs> i mean you say if it takes me more than five minutes to message back if it takes me more than five minutes to message back Matt, you know that things are normal because i am an absolute bugger for getting back to anyone whether it's via message, the worst. email. i am shocking and i i acknowledge that i am on my phone 24 7 uh, whether it be writing, whether it be watching, whether it be reviewing. And Kirsty will mock me incessantly because for someone who spends so much time on his phone, I am damn near impossible to get a hold of, um, whether it's via phone call or whether it's via text, because I don't have my phone on loud either, which uh, is annoys everyone. Um, but yeah, somehow, somehow I managed to, you know, it can take me upwards of two and a half hours. So if anyone out there that listens to this podcast has ever tried to get in touch with me, um, including on Twitter, which I am also a dreadful person for trying to get back to on that. Uh, so yes, please don't take it personally. I am just a terrible person. Um, but anyway, let's uh, you're, let... you're, you're not a terrible person in set in general. You're just terrible at getting back to text. I just <laughs> want to clarify that you just said I'm a terrible person. And the best part is not that I want to keep raining, raining on your brother, keep get put more heat on you. <laughs> like you're not to boy. The best is like, I'll see, cause I know there's a five hour time zone difference. And I know Rob is kind of up later than I am. I go to bed crazy early and whatnot, but I'll see that he read my text message. <laughs> And then like 12 hours later, he'll get back to me. And be like, I really like that idea. That's a great idea. And I'm like, what did I tell him? I'm like, I got to go back and read the text because even though he read it 20 minutes after I sent it, it takes him a half a day to respond. So, uh, but Hey, that's it. At least we know where we stand, my man. <laughs> Absolutely. Everyone has their quirks. Am I right? Um, but yeah, anyway, it is a, a stardom podcast. So I suppose we should probably talk about some stardom, Matt. Um, uh, I mean, it's been, 
it's been in equal parts a jam-packed week if you are a fan of stardom and also if you are trying to watch stardom it's also been a very very quiet week um so i mean there have been shows on the 6th the 8th and the 9th um but unfortunately with one thing and another um, we're recording this on the 11th of April. We're recording it a, a day early because I'm going away for my birthday. Um, so at the time of recording, only the Sendai show from the 6th was actually up. So in terms of our reviews today, we're only actually going to be reviewing one show and one match, the match from Sakura Genesis that involved Mercedes Monet, Hazuki, and Azumi. So you know, make of that what you will. It might even be a shorter episode though. we did say that oh. at the start of the previous episode and that went two hours. So um, we will, of course, be giving our thoughts because it is sort of the go-home week before the final of the Cinderella Tournament 2023. So we'll be talking a little bit about that, sort of giving our final picks, our predictions, things like that. We'll also look ahead to the Corican show the night before, um, give our predictions for, you know, the top matches. So Azumi taking on Saki Kashima for the high-speed title, the last ever My Himi match and the one-night um, reconciliation of ALK. Um, and we'll also talk a lot of things all-star grand queendom because of course as we are talking about this we are just over a week away just under two weeks just over a week depending on your outlook on life um we are increasingly close to what i fully believe will be a show of the year in any promotion um you look at that card especially now it's been completed been fleshed out um you look at that card i sincerely doubt that any company around the world is going to top the potential of all-star grand queendom on the 23rd of april in the yokohama arena um we will talk of course about the latest chaos that was the stardom press conference that was earlier today as we record so we'll be talking a little bit about that but obviously we'll do it in chronological order so we don't ruin it or spoil it for people i am just going to quickly say obviously if you haven't seen the show from sendai you haven't seen the iwgp women's championship match from sakura genesis or you want to avoid spoilers just leave listening to the podcast for a day or so that's absolutely fine you're under no time constraints. You don't have to listen to it as soon as it comes out. Just, you know, take your time. Um, we don't want to spoil your enjoyment. Um, but anyway, Matt, what is coming up on our Patreon this week? On the Patreon coming up this week, uh, Kyrie, uh, her 2000, this is when she was Kyrie saying, her 2017 May Young Classic win. That'll be up on the Patreon by the time this episode drops. Also, the uh, Shiri, the bonus episode, because I did say once we hit over 50 Patreon members, which we did, I will be doing a complete Shiri World of Stardom Championship review. And that is for all tiers. That is for the $1 tier, the $3 tier, and the $5 tier. That'll be up by the end of the month. Also, at the end of the month, we'll be getting uh, Kyrie's complete uh, World of Stardom Championship reign. And then also on the uh, the alternate commentary we are doing, we're literally going to be recording right after this podcast, Kyrie and Yoko Bido take on the team of Jungle Kiona and Rob, I got tag you in here. Who is Jungle Kiona's partner? I'm, Matsumoto. I'm blanking. There it is. Yeah, there it is. A match that I've never seen before. And I kind of just want to just go back real quick to uh, Kyrie's World of Stardom Championship reign. I did mention how I had a whole bunch of time off and I've been watching a whole lot of stardom. And I'm just about done with the, the homework on Kyrie's World of Stardom Championship uh, run. Rob, have you ever seen the match where Kyrie defends the red belt against Mayu? I haven't. No, I don't think I have. It's it's crazy because I remember I'm looking at like my notes and I'm like, how have I not seen this? It's for the most important belt in Stardom, which I don't know if you know this, Rob. I do a podcast for. It's <laughs> literally two of my favorite wrestlers, it, not only in the company but like ever. I'm like, how it's in Cork and all. How? I'm like, I've had, I've seen this. So the match starts right. Or they're doing the entrances, and I'm like, I'm 90 percent sure I haven't seen this. And then Kyrie comes out with this massive, massive hat. I mean, it's like comical. It's like something <laughs> out of The Simpsons. I'm like, I know I've never seen this. So 
Here's okay. The the match to the shock of no one is great. Like Kyrie is Kyrie. Mayu is like a year or two away from being crazy insane Mayu, but she's still phenomenal. So when they go to do the picture with Rossi, when Kyrie turns, her hat hits Rossi in the face, <laughs> and Rossi's so annoyed by it that Kyrie is like, "Oh, sorry for like two seconds," and then you see like the Joker smile where she's like, "I'm just gonna do it again," and then she brushes. Uh, Roxy again in the <laughs> middle of the photo with this giant hat. And I'm like, I have to bring this up on the podcast. So I'm like, one, I can't believe I haven't seen this. And it's, again, it's a great, great matchup. Uh, not as good as their uh, Wonder of Stardom Championship match, but I mean, that, that's top tier. This one isn't too far behind. But just watching Kyrie make her entrance with this massive hat and then hit Rossi Ogawa, who's also known as the Hat Man with this giant hat. I mean, right there, it's almost five stars. But uh, <laughs> yes. So that's what we have coming up on the Patreon. Uh, next week, uh, we are going to be unveiling all the crazy stuff we're going to be doing for uh, for the month of May for the new Patreon. So we're just, uh, Rob and I have been texting back and forth what we want to do. We have our guest all lined up for who's going to be doing the um, roundtable discussion. So as if we're not jam-packed enough next week when we're going to be doing the uh, review of the uh of the Cinderella tournament, our preview of the giant Yokohama show. We figured, Hey, if we're going to load this show up, let's load it up and let everybody know what we're doing for the new, uh, you know, what all the categories are not categories, but all the exact um, shows are going to be. So we'll have what the, the poll is going to be for the bi-weekly bo- uh, podcast. And uh, Rob will have his two matches that he's picking for the alternate commentary. I'll have my two matches that I'm picking for the alternate commentary as well. So, uh, we're saying this is going to be a short show, knock on wood, fingers crossed, laughing, but we know next week is going to be a jam-packed show. So uh, stay tuned next week for all the crazy stuff we're doing in May. Oh, and also, if you do subscribe to the YouTube, I did drop the um, the little promo there that I did after Lily and I came from the movies that uh, our next guest on for doing for an interview, whether it's going to be April or May, don't know yet, is going to be former Ring of Honor owner and current Ring of Honor ambassador and arguably the most important figurehead in the history of Ring of Honor, one Carrie Silken. So uh, that is going really, really looking forward to that. Um, I've gotten to know Carrie at my time in Ring of Honor. Great, great guy. A guy who has so many fantastic stories. Um, I wanted to get him on the pod just because obviously he was there when they started him, had the working relationship with Ring of Honor. And uh, I sent him a message. I said, would you want to come on and talk a little bit about stardom, you know, about Mayu and maybe have any Hannah Kimura stories? He said, absolutely, he would love to. And then an hour later, he's like, hey, man, I hope you don't mind, but I th- this podcast is going to be very little about stardom. And maybe some, can I tell some Noah stories about booking Kabashi and Masawa? And I'm like, yeah, sure. I'm sure nobody will mind <laughs> if you talk about Mitsuhara Masawa and Kenta Kabashi. And considering the fact our last interview, Alice in Danger, was very, very little about, about stardom and just a really, really good conversation. I'm sure nobody will mind on that on that front. No, absolutely not. Especially as one of my one of my favorite matches of all time is uh, Samoa Joe versus Kenta Kabashi from uh, October 2005. So the fact that I'm going to be able to ask him about that match, how it came about, and all the sort of backstage things that go along with that is uh, something I'm very much looking forward to. Um, what I'll do is, as we come close to the time and sort of nail down a specific uh, date for this interview, I will put um, a thread up on Patreon, a thread up on Twitter, uh, for you to ask Harry any questions that you have as well. And, you know, speaking of interviews, we've got some really exciting prospects coming up um there's you know a couple of things that if they come off are going to be very 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 exciting so it's a great time uh as part of the stardom cast it's a very exciting time um and then obviously yeah as matt has already mentioned next month may we'll see the uh the relaunch of uh, the stardom cast extra our patreon page um and if you want to see a little bit of what we're going to be including on that i am going to post the patreon release schedule up on Twitter, and that'll be pinned at the top of our Twitter feed so that you can see the kind of things that we're going to be dropping on a monthly or, in some cases, quarterly basis. Um, of course, if you're already a patron, um, you're able to see that already, and you can sort of see what sort of things take your fancy. But again, May is going to be extremely exciting, as is the end of 
April because Jesus Christ have stardom loaded this show. And just while we're on the point of that, we're going to just dive into just a little bit of news um, because there wasn't a great deal, to be fair, to come out of this week in terms of breaking news or news, really. Um, but Chris Charlton um, at Reason JP on Twitter announced it was sort of spoiled on the Sakura Genesis show by Kevin Kelly, who basically went, no one knows this, but ah, we might as well break it. Um, that There is going to be English commentary for that All-Star Grand Queendom show from Yokohama Arena uh, with Chris Charlton on call alongside Sonny Gutierrez and Momo Kogo. Um, obviously, we had a little bit of a taste of Momo Kogo um, in the press conference for Mercedes Monet and Mayu Iwatani, which we're going to talk about a bit later. But the fact that we are going to have English commentary, which is a question we get a lot, um, is when is stardom going to add more English commentary? I think this show is the perfect opportunity, especially as it is selling so well, Matt. Yeah, and um, you know, you're talking about what's the perfect time for English opportunity. If you subscribe to the Patreon, you can hear English commentary. Yes, you can. Uh, every, every week. There you go. There's the plug back in the Patreon. Yeah, but they really I think the last time they had English commentary was uh it was World Climax, right? They didn't have it for Dream Queendom. I yep. think it was World Climax was the last time that they had English commentary. Yes, yeah, so so a year, a year ago. Yeah, a year. So, and it's obviously Chris Charlton really, really knows this stuff. I, I was kind of hoping that it would have been one Kevin Kelly. Kevin's been nothing. I mean, first of all, he's fantastic. Uh, what he does, he's a great commentator. He's always great with the WWE stuff he did back in the two thousands. He's great with New Japan, and Kevin's been nothing but fantastic to us. Uh, and really helping us out, always, you know, helping us out with shout outs and whatnot. He's been nothing but uh, A plus plus. So I was kind of hoping he would have been on the call, but uh, Chris Charlton, Sonny, and then Momo Kogo. So that should be an interesting team. But yeah, it, that's and that's really, I mean, it's smart because you have one of the biggest uh, female wrestling stars in North America in the last ten years on the so, on the show with uh, Mercedes Monet. So I think that's really, really smart to invest in an English commentary team because there is going to be, especially, and obviously we'll talk about it after, uh, you know, the match, the three-way match for the IWGP women's championship. There's been a lot of people over here in the States that are to really, really invest in uh, what she's doing in new Japan. And I was, you know, a lot of people that I talked to who do not see much of stardom were completely blown away with that match. I was like, wait, till you, what, you haven't seen anything yet. Because the match that we're getting on the 23rd in Yokohama, that's going to be worth the price of admission alone. Absolutely. I mean, we talked about it briefly last week when they announced what is effectively the full card. We have the full card now. Um, the, with the exception of maybe the two openers, so the Rumble and the eight-woman tag, this could literally have seven or eight four-star plus matches. Um because you've got, what is it, six title matches and Micah Five? versus Himika. Five title matches and Micah versus Himika. And then you've got the high-speed tag as well. It's going to be an absolutely incredible match. I'm very, very, very excited for the card as a whole. Um, as is apparently everybody else, as uh, Scotty Wrestling Friend of the Show um, on Twitter tweeted out today that eight of the 13 sections for the Yokohama Arena are now sold out. So uh, that's excellent news. Obviously, you know, having Mercedes Monet on the show is certainly a big draw, but the card itself has got to be a massive, massive reason as to why the show is selling so well. There is a caveat that the four sections that aren't sold out are the bigger sections, but even so, to have the uh, to have the knowledge that you've sold eight of 13 sections is nothing but a good thing. Am I right, Matt? Absolutely. I mean, yeah. And again, we're still, you know, a week and a half away and a lot of pro wrestling always does see a lot of walk up business. Uh, it doesn't matter if you're WWE or some of the uh, independents that I've been around, some of the smaller independents that I've been around uh, in my 20 plus years, you know, being on the independents, man, that sounds old. But yeah, the, a lot of wrestling, they do get a lot of walk up business. Um, so I, you'll see, you know, that number obviously jump up quite a bit. And I did ask, you know, Scotty wrestling, and I did put this out on Twitter and maybe can, can, you know, help me out. Cause I'm always very, 
um, interested in when I, when it comes to the numbers. Again, we know that Stoudem has sold all eight of the 13 section, sections, excuse me, as of this recording. If anybody can tell me like roughly what the number is that they sold and how big the Yokohama Arena uh, is set up for this show. I know when they did the uh, AJW show uh, back in 93 or 94, I think it sold something like 16,000 tickets. So I don't think it's going to be set up for that. But I'm just curious if anybody has any idea what they're set up for, roughly how many tickets they sold. Uh, you guys know how to get a hold of me. Just you know, shoot me a message, uh, Matt Turner OF on Twitter, because I'm just uh, I'm just wondering if this is going to sell more than seven thousand tickets, which would be more than they did for um, the historic crossover show. And I would not be surprised if it did. One, the cards crazy stacked. Two, you have a little, little dream match in there. And three, that main event is, and obviously we'll talk about it, is uh is boy, it might be one of the most dangerous main events in the history of uh, of stardom that that really requires no weapons. But uh, yeah, I would not be shocked if this thing, you know, is six, seven thousand tickets. So again, if anybody has an idea what that number is that they sold, you know, you know let me know because I'm always interested in that. I mean, looking looking at previous attendances at the Yokohama Arena, one of the the latest shows to run that was, of course, New Japan's Wrestle Kingdom 17 in Yokohama where they ran the uh, Noah versus New Japan card. And that drew just over 5,500 people. I think if you're stardom and you can draw 4,000, 4,500, again, it completely depends on how the venue is set up. Um, And of course, you know, obviously we are at the tail end of the pandemic now, but there are still certain pandemic... um, restrictions in place i think if stardom can draw four thousand, which makes it their biggest solely ran show ever beating out um, world climax being out dream queendom then and again i'm sort of putting an asterisk by the uh the Ryogoku cinderella show from 2013 because it's widely reported that it wasn't the 5,500 people that they said it was um i think if they can draw 4,000 you know 4,200 people to this show i think that will be considered a huge huge success for stardom again it completely depends i think the confirmation of the IWGP Women's Championship match that we definitely are getting now, which I think everyone sort of suspected that we were getting, but we definitely are getting now. I think that's going to do a lot of business. Um, And again, even if Stardom don't sell 4,000 tickets, you know, I still feel like there's not a lot else they could do because this card is, what, I reckon it's the best card they could possibly put out. I mean, there's no matches there that I'm like, how have you not done this? It was right there. How have you not done this? I mean, you've got Suri versus Chihiro Hashimoto, which obviously, you know, six, seven months ago, we'd have been like, Suri's got to be in a top titles match. And yeah, it's one of the matches I'm, I'm most excited for, and it's a special singles match. So overall, incredibly exciting for the card in general. And uh, it's incredibly exciting that Stardom are going to have one of their most well-attended shows in just over a week. So altogether, very, very exciting. And we are going to talk a little more about this show, in fact, quite a lot over the course of this podcast. But I just want to briefly take a break from that just to report the final little bit, again, courtesy of Scotty Wrestling that the third Hanakamura memorial show pinks which will be taking place on the 23rd of may and um, there are three stardom representatives uh, that are going to be uh, part of that show uh, suri and rena had been previously announced to take place on that show i'm particularly happy that rena is there um obviously she takes you know she would hannah was a huge part of her early career and then uh, nat Sapoy is the latest confirmation. Now, I did read somewhere, and again, I'm useless at stuff like this. I do like to and sort of tell people where this has come from, but I read somewhere on Twitter a while ago that there was only going to be three people from Stardom that will be taking part in the Pink's show. So unless I'm very much mistaken, that is the extent of the Stardom participation on that show. But Natsupoi, Suri, and Rina 
will be taking part in the show Pinks, which uh, Matt, unless I'm very much mistaken, we will be talking about on this podcast. Absolutely. Only if you want to, sir. That's the type of guy. And if you want to talk about it and the fact that Natsupoy cut her hair just to cut the promo to saying that she was on it <laughs> on this show. <laughs> That's a boy's hair is the biggest continuity error in stardom. <laughs> it's amazing. <laughs> I love it. I love it. You just keep dancing, that's a boy. Now you're all right. <laughs> and kicking people in the face. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, initially, obviously, we'll go into our show reviews now initially. And even at the start of this podcast, I was like, yeah, we'll do things chronologically. We're not going to. We're going to kick straight into Sakura Genesis. Um, simply because we've already talked about uh, the mercedes Monet mayu match. And we'll talk a little bit about, like I said, the chaotic press conference in a moment. Um, but first, we had what would be mercedes Monet second title. Uh, sorry, her first title defense uh, since taking the belt from Kairi. And this was at New Japan Sakura Genesis 2023 at Sumo Hall. Saturday, the 8th of April, 2020. 23 in front of 6,510 people. Uh, match five, of course, is the match that we're going to be talking about. Um, the IWGP Women's Championship three way match. Mercedes Monet, the champion, defeating the challengers Azumi or AZM, depending on how you want to pronounce it, uh, and Hazuki with Mercedes pinning Azumi with the moneymaker in 13 minutes and 53 seconds. So there's a couple of things from this match, Matt. Um, the first thing is that I know going into it, people, with it being fifth on the card, you knew you weren't going to get 20, 25 minutes. Um, by having both Azumi and Hazuki in the match, who are both proponents of a high speed style, the question then became, can Mercedes Monet wrestle a high speed match? Okay. And this isn't just a high speed match against one or the other this is against both of them at the same time meaning that the chances for a breather are quite slim the third thing and this this i very rarely disagree with dave Meltzer simply because wrestling is subjective and we talk about this all the time with star ratings you like what you like and that's absolutely fine um what he did say was and again, I read this on Twitter and I meant to note it down. So if it was you, tell me and I'll um, I'll sort of tweet about it afterwards. But apparently on the review show they did afterwards, um, Meltzer said that it was the, the, not the worst title match on the card, but, well, yeah, effectively the worst title match on the card. Now, he didn't say that as um, a slight against this match. I think it's more along the lines of, you know, you're the poorest billionaire. It's a case of all of the title matches were so damn good on this show. I mean, anyone that watched the full show, Sonata versus Okada, incredible match. Um, Aussie Open versus Bishaman, what a match that was. Um, you'd got the junior title match um, between, I think it was Hiromu and, was it Robbie Eagles as well? Robbie Eagles, yes, sir. Um, yes, sir. So, you know, and the Save. TV title match with Saber and uh, um, Umino. not Ren Narita, Shota Umino. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that match is great. Yeah, that, yep, that match is great too. So to say that, you know, this match was perhaps the poorest of the title matches, I don't think it's a slight in this match. I think it's more a case of, you know, this show was incredibly stacked. This show was a really, really good show. Um, however, Matt, what was your opinion of this match? Did Mercedes Monet silence any doubters who or any remaining doubters obviously this match completely different to a Kyrie match at battle in the valley back in uh, february did she silence those doubters who potentially think she can't wrestle a japanese style or indeed a high speed style in my opinion and in the opinion of about 90 percent of the people that i've talked to 100 percent, there are some people that once mercedes came in to uh, New Japan slash stardom uh, at Wrestle Kingdom that were, they automatically saw it on her. She's a quitter, botch banks, yada, yada, yada. Those people that have, they have the preconceived notions, they're not going to like her regardless, which is fine. Absolutely fine. Again, it's subjective. You can like who you like. I've always liked Sasha Banks ever since I've seen her on NXT, and I always thought she would be a great fit in with the stardom wrestlers. And boy, howdy, well, she was awesome here. Hazuki was awesome. 
And to me, obviously, I know I'm a huge Azumi fan, and I apologize to the listeners, Rob, it's Azumi, not AZM. Um, <laughs> uh, I think not only was it Azumi, and, and I knew Huzuki was going to be great. I knew Mercedes was going to be great. And I knew Azumi was going to be great. But Azumi was just like, I'm going to steal the entire show. Other for me, and I watched this whole entire show, um, other than Ozzy Open, Azumi was the MVP of this show. I thought Okada was great. Sonata was great. Zach say all those guys, uh, they were great. Other than if I'm giving out medals, Azumi was the silver medalist here in the entire show. I thought she really won over when she hit that crazy dive that she does, that she does running from corner to corner hits the dive. She, she took her time to, uh, you know, go to the crowd and make sure she got her pop and got her love there. And they, they, they popped and uh, they chanted Azumi. I thought Azumi was unbelievable here, but I thought all three ladies were fantastic. And I'm, I'm really, I know I was, me and you, I was texting you on a Saturday and you said you were in Manchester. I didn't want to spoil anything um, for, for, uh, for this match. And obviously we've been talking quite a bit the last couple of days. I don't know what your star rating is and I'm excited to hear it because I know me and you both said we thought it would be four and a quarter for me. It exceeded it. I had it at four and a half. And one of the many reasons why I'm excited to hear what your star rating is, majority of the people I talked to had this at four and three fourths and five stars. There were as much as I knew, and usually I'm, you know, a lot of people say don't ask Matt for his opinion on Marvel movies. They're all A plus or wrestling because he just loves it so much, yada, yada, yada. That usually my star rating nine times out of ten is higher than majority. Um, but as much as I love this match, there were people out there that enjoyed it more than I did, which I absolutely love and it got so i mean this is the match clearly I and mean, we had a new a brand new champion sonata winning the belt for the very first time over arguably the greatest iwgp champion of all time and that wasn't even the big talk the big talk was this match so i thought this match was absolutely fantastic we'll get into it uh in a little bit but i'm just uh i'm just curious my friend uh hit me with it what was your star rating on this bad boy i gave you four and a quarter um i thought this was fantastic and in fact aside from Aussie Open and Bisherman this was my match of the show I thought yep. all three women bought something completely different and I am going to put over Mercedes Monet who I thought did a fantastic job I think a lot of the match was carried by Izumi and Hazuki. understandably it's their style something they are you know very used to very accustomed to very comfortable in um but all three women, as I said, brought something different. Hazuki bought that hard-hitting aggression. Like, everything she did, you felt the hatred. You felt that rage in her that she seems to get whenever she wrestles. She walks to the ring, she smiles, and then she unleashes in the ring, and it's great. You've got Azumi, who, in a very small amount of time, was made into this underdog baby face you know just the little thing mercedes my name mispronouncing a name refusing to show her the respect of actually getting her name right they made it into an angle which azumi then profited from yes she took the pinfall but she was by the end of this match she'd managed to turn an entire crowd around to supporting her because of just the good amount of work the good amount of groundwork that they'd done Mercedes Monet, if anybody is left now that doesn't think that she can work this style, you watched a different match. And I thought she did a fantastic job in America against Kyrie, who is used to wrestling an American style. That match was fantastic. I still thought to myself, is she going to be able to do it in Japan? under pressure, against two of the quickest wrestlers in stardom. And she answered yes, quite spectacularly. And she did a fantastic job of especially elevating Azumi to that standard as well. Like, you can say, yes, you know, potentially she didn't do the sequences as quickly as Azumi and Hazuki. However, she bought something completely different. She was a great focal point for this match. And she brought some fantastic energy to it. She sold brilliantly. She bumped fantastically. I mean, I always wonder how people sell the the um, Hazuki face wash kicks. 
And that's sort of a that's sort of a thing for me. If you sell that well, I think you're going to be all right. And Mercedes Monet sold it fantastically. And I think the sequences all three women managed to do together was great. And something I've never, whenever I've watched triple threats or three way matches, you tend to get with some notable exceptions. You tend to get two wrestlers with one taking a break on the outside, and sort of they they alternate. And you know that's that's absolutely fine. I thought for the vast majority of this match, all three women were involved, and I thought that that was a great sort of a great nod to how comfortable Mercedes felt in this ring with Azumi and Hazuki, and how well they gelled as a three. I think 13 minutes was a perfect time. I don't think they needed any more time at all. You know, completely contrary to Wrestle Kingdom. Mercedes Monet got a fantastic reception from Sumo Hall. She got the biggest reception of the match, obviously. She's, you know, as Mayu said in the press conference, you know, a couple of days after. She's a worldwide superstar. People know her name. But I thought overall, this should have silenced any remaining doubters that Mercedes Monet can wrestle a Japanese style. I think she did everything she possibly could. I thought Azumi and Hazuki were fantastic. I thought the match was a fantastic sprint. Um, and overall, yeah, absolutely loved it. Four and a quarter stars. Yeah, um, there's, I mean, I'm, I'm assuming, if you haven't seen the match, by all means, please go and watch it. Yeah, this was fantastic, fantastic, especially if you're big fans of Hazuki and Azumi, who, again, Rob mentioned, they wrestled in front of well over 6,000 people at this jam-packed show. And uh, no, really, it looked like Hazuki may have had a little bit of nerves, but I think once it got going, they were out. Azumi just seemed like she was in her element the moment she walked out. And for her being 20 years old and uh, just being that confident in front of that big of a crowd just goes to speak volumes how phenomenal Azumi was. Yeah, there was some fantastic parts in this match, but probably my favorite part Again, if you listen to this podcast, you know how much I love Hazuki and how much I love just her fiercest when she throws her strikes. So Mercedes hits her with his forearm and then follows it up with a left slap and then a right slap. And immediately I sat there on my couch as I'm watching this live and I'm like, oh, a receipt's coming. It's going to come soon. And I knew a receipt was coming soon, but I didn't know it was coming two seconds later. So Hazuki throws the first forearm with her right and with her left, she has her arm out, meaning she's going to cup the back of Mercedes neck. So this way she can't move and she's going to start drilling her with forearms. Obviously, it's really cool to hit that one Mitsuhara Masawa, Masawa style big forearm. But th- at least this way, Hazuki knows, all right, I owe you a receipt. You're not getting away. And she hits her with two of them and Mercedes just crumbles. And I'm like, I don't know if she's selling or she just really hit her. And then she's on top of her in full mount and she's just drilling Mercedes with these forearms. And then the camera goes the other way and you see poor Mercedes is just covering up. So uh, I thought it was really cool that uh, Hazuki Norizumi did not hold back at all, beating the bejesus out of a worldwide superstar like Mercedes Monet. And uh, just knowing how much Mercedes loves Japanese wrestling, that might have been her call. She might have been like, don't be afraid to hit me, hit me. Like, please, by all means, we're in Japan. This is your style. Because make no mistake about it. Obviously, Hazuki's the heavy hitter here. Azumi's not too far behind. Azumi is a very, very underrated striker, especially with those kicks. And gee, she must have, I think she threw three or four double stomps in this match. And boy, she did not hold back at all. But uh, yeah, I thought that was, um, I thought that was like my favorite part of the match. It was just like, oh, Mercedes, you're going to catch hands. And uh, yeah, she caught him real quick right after because Hazuki responded as only Hazuki can in kind by dropping Mercedes Monet. And I thought the finish was fantastic. The moneymaker from Azumi. Oh, well, it's really, um, Hazuki goes for the brain buster on, on Mercedes. Azumi comes behind Hazuki, catches her in a roll-up, and then Mercedes catches uh, Azumi from catching Hazuki, gets her in the moneymaker on top of Hazuki, and then pins Azumi. Uh, again, fantastic match. And then I don't know if you caught it, But afterwards in the backstage, like, you know, right after when New Japan does the backstage interviews right after the match, Mercedes put over Hazuki and Azumi huge, basically just saying, you know, these two are the future. They're going to be great, great big stars. They're fantastic. But I'm the uh, I'm the present. So she did a great, great job putting over both Hazuki and Azumi, not only in the ring, but after the match as well. And there really is nothing more 
that you would want if you're a stardom fan than uh, have those two wrestlers elevated in that match and the post match as well. We talk about it all the time on this podcast. It's not who loses, it's how you lose. And I think everybody knew going into this that Mercedes Monet was going to win this match. Like, it didn't matter who was pinned, it didn't matter how she was winning this match. What mattered was how Azumi and Hazuki looked with Mercedes Monet. And I think Mercedes Monet worked extremely hard to put over both of these women in the match. And I think, you know, especially Azumi, the fact that, you know, they you had that angle with Azumi, building Azumi as that underdog baby face, something that Mercedes does with Mayu in this press conference, which we're going to talk about, you know, basically straight after this. Um, I think the fact that Mercedes is going that extra mile to put everyone over, she is 100% in this. You know, this isn't just a cashing check let's say. It's not just a, right, well, I'm going to win this amount of money. You know, I'll do these dates and then I'm back off to WWE or AEW or wherever she will ultimately end up. This is like, she is fully invested in this. And whether that is, you know, the way she handles herself during the press conferences, whether it's how she puts over talent during the matches, how she goes in with a complete disrespect of them and then comes out afterwards and is so full of praise for the Japanese talent, I think she's doing a fantastic job. And to be honest, I don't think you can criticize. In fact, my only real criticism, and I know this is going to sound like a real nitpick, but until Mayu took the moneymaker, I had no idea what move it was supposed to be. <laughs> because to this moment, like I know that the Azumi match, it was, it was slightly different because Mercedes Monet did it to Azumi, so it landed on top of Hazuki, which was a really cool spot, by the way. I really like that. Um, but until Mayu took it at the press conference, I didn't know how it was supposed to be taken because the one against Kyrie was a little bit like she landed funny, and then obviously at Wrestle Kingdom, it was a little bit of a it went a little bit wrong because you know Sasha Banks was wearing 18 foot heels. <laughs> um, but that's my only real nitpick about the Mercedes Monet run. I mean, if that's your only criticism, if that's my only criticism, then, I mean, I think she's doing a tremendous job. Stardom would be stupid, or New Japan, sorry, would be stupid to take the belt off mercedes Monet at the, at the moment. And that is something that we are going to talk about in a moment, <laughs> because who came out to challenge mercedes Monet? but Mayu Iwatani. Um, she gave a promo to which Mercedes Monet then slapped Mayu hard across the <laughs> face and then left, um, which prompted the press conference, which was, as of today, the 11th of April, when we're recording this, it was this morning, English time, 11, uh, 10 a.m. And in true start and fashion, it was not just a press conference. Get out of here. Get out of <laughs> here. You're telling me on this show, we're going to talking about Another crazy starting press conference and more Julia versus Tam violence. Get out of here, Rob. I don't believe you. <laughs> I know. Who'd have thought it? Um, I mean, the press conference itself, the video, I think, is only 21 minutes. And the press conference, I think, is only 15. But they managed to pack, they being Mayu and Mercedes Monet, they managed to pack so much into this press conference. Like you, and there's a thread on Twitter. And again, I'm going to put over our friend Scotty Wrestling. It's a fantastic thread. But he makes the point that this match didn't need any story to it. It didn't need any heel versus baby face. It didn't need any, you know, underdog. It didn't need any backstory because it is a dream match. You have got Sasha Banks of the WWE taking on the icon of stardom. And yet this 15 minute press conference, they managed to build an entire narrative to whatever happens at Yokohama Arena. I mean, just the first first point of this, the first frame of this was Mercedes Monet strutting into the into wherever it was they were doing it, into the room, and looking a million bucks, by the way. You know, swaggering in. You know, she's dancing to a theme, she's holding the belt, and you've got Mayu standing meekly next to her, never taking her eyes off the belt, knowing that she should have been that champion but she lost to Kyrie, which Mercedes then brings up. Yeah, he might be the icon of stardom, but he didn't beat Kyrie. I did. 
straight away you've got a little bit of story, a little bit of a redemption arc. And then you've got Mayu being the underdog babyface. I'm Mercedes Monet and I am worldwide. You might be the icon of stardom. You might be famous in Japan. I'm Mercedes Monet and I am money. I am worldwide. People know who I am. People, you aren't going to do this, Mayu. You've already failed once. You're going to fail again. And the fact that they are bringing all this in and making the icon of stardom, you know, the person that we know is going to put on this fantastic match, the underdog in this match is just, it was brilliant. And it's just added even more excitement surrounding this match because the temptation could quite have easily been, I don't think anyone would have blamed Rossi or the stardom higher ups if they'd have just said, you know what? <laughs> we don't need to do anything here. Mayu versus Sasha Banks or Mayu versus Mercedes Monet. I'm going to have to get used to not saying Sasha Banks. <laughs> um, it sells itself. It's a dream match. I mean, Jesus Christ, three, four years ago, this never would have happened. Yet here we are. But they didn't. They've added another layer to it. And then you've got that beautiful moment where Mercedes Monet slaps Mayu Iwatani, then hits the moneymaker through a damn table. Um, it looked like a nasty bump, to be fair, for Mayu, but Mayu is absolutely no stranger to uh, terrible bumps. Um, but overall, I thought this press conference was fan. Fantastic. Momo Kogo doing the English translations of Mayu's rambling promo was excellent. Um, Mayu basically saying, I thought you'd be a lot bigger. <laughs> just, just <laughs> what? I, I assume she meant that, you know, she's used to seeing, you know, Mercedes Monet as Sasha Banks being this larger than life personality. Yet, you know, you're just a human, you know, you're just a person the same as me. I assume that was the gist of uh, Mayu's promo, but Momo Coco just basically went, you look small, which really made me laugh. <laughs> um, maybe I, th- I I took it as maybe her, she only had two, uh, two, two inch heels on instead of eight inch heels. That's the way that I think it, but I could be wrong again. I don't know. You know I don't know. <laughs> Absolutely. The great Monet teaming with uh, the mm-hmm. great car C. Um, <laughs> I think, there it is, folks. You absolutely. heard it here, folks. So when that so when that match happens in Cork and Hall in six months, you imagine, heard it here, folks. Imagine. Um, and then of course you had the infamous moment where Mercedes Monet played her new hit single according to the English Twitter feed of Stardom. Uh Mayu sucks. So uh, we are properly lavishing on the whole Mayu is the underdog babyface, Mercedes Monet is the heel. Um now before I get your thoughts on the uh, on the press conference, Matt. Um, Chris Charlton brought up a fantastic point on commentary and you know Kevin Kelly and Chris Charlton were fantastic on commentary during this match as they were for the whole show he said if you're stardom why would you take the belt off Mercedes Monet and I was thinking about it and actually he's got a very 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 good point Mercedes Monet is the hottest free agent in wrestling You know, as her name suggests, she brings in money. She brings eyes to the product. Now, just by being in the ring, like people who follow stardom, people who follow Japanese wrestling, know who Mayu Iwatani is. However, if I asked my mate who only watches WWE who Mayu Iwatani is, he would look at me and go, who? Mm -hmm. And she's one of the greatest wrestlers in the world. Just by being against Mercedes Monet, with English commentary, far more people are going to be exposed to Mayu Iwatani. My question to you, Matt, is that Mercedes Monet has now done that for Azumi and Hazuki. Not to the same extent, admittedly, but she's going to do that to Mayu Iwatani. Do you then have her drop the belt? Or do you have her hold on to it and continue? to elevate talent and therefore by proxy continue to elevate stardom this will probably be a question i'll have a better answer next week for because i know next week is our big big preview but uh kind of tiptoe around the answer for us who are i'm a huge mayu watani fan you you are probably the biggest mayu fan 
So it's kind of a win-win. Like I don't, I get asked all the time who my favorite stardom wrestler is. A lot of people think it's because of how much I wax poetically about Tam. It's Tam. It's not. My favorite all time is Io Shirai, but my favorite current stardom wrestler is the same one as Rossi Ogawa's, the person that's going to bring in the most eyes. So uh, right now, I mean, there's good, the, the, the biggest wrestling company in the, in the world are America. I always say wrestling subjective, but you can't go against the numbers. The two biggest wrestling companies in the world are, are WWE and AEW. So technically here in America, we kind of have the biggest fan base. So the fact that there's going to be more eyes on this show because Mercedes Monet, who obviously is a huge, huge star in the WWE for many, many years, is going to be on that show. And I know friends of mine that are either going to get the pay-per-view or they're going to wait a couple days till it comes out on Stardom World and get it. They're not only going to see this fantastic match. They've never seen Mayu before. I'm just starting to educate them now. But if they're going to watch, I tell them, watch the whole entire show. They're going to be blown away with Sherry. They're going to be blown away by the violence that is going to be the main event with Julie and Tam. They're going to be blown away by me and Sai Kamatani, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, I don't have that answer just yet, Rob. That is that is a great question. Supposedly, her uh, this is her last date on her contract, but I guess that's not true true at all. So I can see this match going either way um, to kind of just kind of give you an answer without kind of just tiptoeing around and say, you know, tag me in next week. I will say this. I think that she drops the belt to Mayu. Uh, again, this isn't my official prediction because that's next week. But then now she goes and elevates other talent without the belt. I don't think she needs the belt to elevate other talent. I think now she can go around, she can go back to America and do a shot at AEW. She can go do a shot, you know, on a big independent. She said she wanted to meet a wrestle Miyu Yamashita in um, Tokyo Joshi Pro. If she's not under contract, if her dates are up, which I don't know, um, she can do that. She can go and work these other shows against the stardom wrestlers. She said she's wanted to work Julia. She said she's wanted to work Starlight Kid. I don't think she necessarily needs the belt to do that because she's such a huge star. For example, Kevin Owens last year at WrestleMania was elevated hugely because he got to wrestle Stone Cold Steve Austin. Would it have made any difference if Stone Cold Steve Austin was the champion going into that show? Now, granted, I know Stone Cold was retired X amount of years, but if he wasn't, like you kind of see my, my train of thought there. Uh, the belt is just an added bonus. I don't think she needs it to elevate other talent. Um, and she can lose. She can lose on a roll up to a starlight kid um, if she's not the champion. Where you know, if she is the champion, that Rossi's going to have to clear that with Ghetto. Hey, I you know because it's technically his belt, but what Rossi's wrestler. So then there'll be less politics. So um, again, it's not my official prediction, but uh, if you want to answer, I think Mayu takes the belt. But the way Mercedes Monet is training at Sendai Girls, and we've seen her train pictures training in the Stardom Ring this past week. Um, I know I think last week or the week before you said that you fully expect her to go back to WWE. I don't think she's going back for at least another year, uh, to be honest, because I think she's just having the time of her life. She's making a bigger name for herself, and she's putting on better matches. And that's no disrespect to the talent in WWE. The talent is so much better in stardom, in my opinion. It's an interesting thought that potentially she doesn't need the title to elevate the talent and what i would say and it's it's something i've been thinking about more and more since we discussed it i'm intrigued because i think they could use mercedes monet in the same way they should in my in my opinion and i know that my opinion does certainly not count for everyone but how they could have used Kyrie to give wrestlers the rub. And I'm not saying she should lose every week. Hell, I don't think she should lose very much at all because then you've got to tread a fine line between giving the rub to other wrestlers and the the polish starting to come off if she loses every single week to everyone she wrestles. However, if you've got to select maybe, I know, two wrestlers, three wrestlers, then I think you've got you've got a lot you can do for the stardom roster. And I'm sure Mercedes Monet, who we've mentioned as a huge, huge fan of Japanese wrestling, I personally think that she would be absolutely fine with that. Um irrelevant pardon me, irrelevant of that, obviously we'll talk a lot more about this next week, because as Matt's already said, next week is our big All Star Grand Queendom preview. And we'll be going through all the matches, talking about all of the eventualities and 
you know, I'm sure we'll both come up with predictions that will inevitably be wrong because we're useless at it. But that's beside the point. Let's have a look. But damn, but damn we have fun making these predictions. Bro. God damn it, we do. <laughs> God damn it, we do. Um, let's have a look at the one show that we are actually going to be looking at today. And it was starting in Sendai from Sendai Pit in Miyagi from Thursday, the 6th of April, 2023 in front of 344 people. What I'll do is I will go through all the results and then we'll sort of cherry pick little things to talk about because there is quite a few things to talk about from this show. Um, So match one, singles match. Hanako versus Aya Sakura ended in a time limit draw at five minutes. So both rookies getting a draw there. First time that they have faced off against each other. Uh, match two, three-way match. You never bet against Fuki and Death in a three-way match, Matt, do you? Fuki and Death defeated Yuna Mizumori and Tekla with an O'Connor roll in six minutes and 16 seconds. Match three, singles match. Starlight Kid defeated Lady C with the Moonsault in seven minutes and 18 seconds. Uh, match four, a six-woman tag match. Club Venus, their mystery partner, was revealed. So the team of Mariah May, Zena, and the debuting Jesse who we'll be talking about in a moment, defeated the Stars team of Hanan, Kogama, and Sayida, with Jesse getting the pinfall over Sayida with her move that she calls the Joyride in 9 minutes and 18 seconds. We had a six-woman tag match. The Uedatai team of Momo Watanabe, Ruaka, and Natsukatora defeating the Stars team of Mayu Iwatani, Hazuki, and Momo Kogo with the Inhuman Driver in 10 minutes and 46 seconds. Match six saw a six-woman tag team match end in a time limit draw of 15 minutes uh, between Donna Del Mondo's team of Julia Maika and Mei Sakurai and the Cosmic Angels team of Tam Nakano, Natsupoy, and Wakasuki Armor. Boy, howdy, we're going to be talking about that match. Um, match seven, a Himika retirement road singles match with Mina Shirakawa defeating Himika with the glamorous collection Mina in 10 minutes and 25 seconds. And then in the main event, we had an eight-woman tag team match, the God's Eye team of Suri, Mirai, Amisori, and Konami, defeating the Queen's Quest team of Yutami Hayashishita, Saya Kamatani, Azumi, and Lady C, with Mirai submitting, uh, not Lady C, Miyu Amasaki, why have I written Lady C? Uh, with Mirai submitting Amasaki with the Mirror Mare in 14 minutes and 32 seconds. So, obviously, the first big thing to come from this is that we have a brand new member of Club Venus, uh, Jesse, who is the former Jesse Camille or Jesse Alaban from NXT. She's 34, 175 centimeters, which is five foot nine, uh, one centimeter bigger than Lady C, just for those people. Or was she 178? Oh, I can't remember. It doesn't matter. Uh, she debuted in 2017. She's also a product of the WWE Performance Center. Uh, she was last seen on NXT TV, losing to Raquel Gonzalez in August of 2021. Um, she was previously part of the ill-fated Robert Stone brand. Um, and she also lost in the first round of the 2018 May Young Classic against Tay Conti. Um, this is the first time that she's wrestled. This match was uh, since October 2022 in CCW. And believe it or not, she actually had a little bit of a spell teaming with none other than Kyrie Sane. In, uh, on the NXT house show loop back in 2018 as well. So we have our mystery partner, Matt, and I suppose the big thing that I want to ask is, what did you think of her? Do you think she covered herself in glory? Obviously, I mentioned that this is her first match since October 2022. How do you think she did? First of all, Rob Goodwin, as always, your stats, unbelievable. Just when I think I take a lot of notes, you just you pull out what you just did. Just bravo, sir. As always, take a bow, sir. Take a bow. Fantastic. Um, considering the fact that you had seven other people in this match, excuse me, five other people uh, in this match, and it went less than 10 minutes, very much like when we saw Zena when she had like a three-minute match with, uh, with Hina at the first night of the uh, Cinderella tournament, you really couldn't see too, too much. Um, I thought that she, her and Mariah May paired well as a trio. I thought from the uh, from what she was in the ring, and they did a good job really spotlighting her. She was definitely the MVP in the match, and they did a great job getting her over, and obviously she got the victory. So um, I thought that they did the best they could with her. Obviously, we will see more of her in the starting ring, but the uh, the one big upside 
that I would like to mention is the fact that she is a product of the WWE slash NXT uh, pretty much performance center, meaning that she was her two main trainers or Norman Smiley and Robbie Brookside. So that can only be a really good thing. And then very much like Mariah May, if she's already put in a group here, um, I'm assuming that she's staying in stardom for a while, which means she'll be training at the stardom dojo. I mean, Mariah May has been part of the stardom roster since the beginning of the year. And just in the first three, three and a half months, I mean, she has just uh, improved leaps and bounds. I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that she's, you know, she's in the ring with the best of the best wrestlers. The fact that she's training in the Stardom Dojo with Hazuki, with Mayu, and then who with whoever else, you know, I know Milano Collection AT for a while there was helping out with some of the training. So that's only going to improve her game. But I thought they did a good job spotlighting her. I thought they gave enough time to everybody else in the match. But uh, so far, so good. And I'm really looking forward to seeing what, what happens. And it's kind of funny. Because like, like two months ago, we thought, well, Waka is definitely going to Club Venus because they only have Mina, Mariah May, and Zaya Brookside leaving. Now, all of a sudden, they want to become a widow tie because now all of a sudden they have all these new members. And then anytime Zaya Brookside wants to come back, you know, she's technically a member of Club Venus and as well as super strong Diamond Machine as well who uh, was not on these shows. So, yeah, I'll, me, Mina creates this group at the end of the year, and all of a sudden I think it's like the biggest faction in all of stardom <laughs> within four months. So good on Mina. Way, way to recruit. Way to recruit, Mina. <laughs> Absolutely. And I think one thing she has got going for her is she is very distinctive. You know, she is incredibly tall. Um, I think she's sold very well. Um, she sold very very well, particularly for Sayurida, and I think that's that's a good sign because... Sire Reader is a lot shorter than Jesse. So overall, I think she did a pretty good job. You're absolutely right. I think nine minutes isn't exactly, you know, the greatest indication of what she's like. From what from the limited research I've done, I've seen people say that she's improved just in the three matches that have been um that she's had in stardom over those uh, those two shows that haven't been uploaded to world yet that she has improved since her time in NXT, which has got to be a good thing. Um, I must admit, I'm not overly familiar with her time in NXT, if I'm being honest. Um, I'm relying on other people to tell me that. But um, yeah, if the improvement in Mariah May is anything to go by, then I think uh, we can expect some good things from Jesse as well, especially if, you know, again, they extend the field of the five star to 483 per block, which is what we think they probably will do. Um, giving Jesse a run of singles matches against top tier stardom talent is going to be, uh, it's going to improve it definitely because in that tournament, it's very much single swim and you look at what it's done for the likes of Hannon, who last year had a great tournament, May Sakurai, who came out of the tournament, a far better wrestler, Mina Shirakawa, who was good going Mina into... Mina Venter, yeah. Yeah, she was good going into last year's tournament, but I think, you know, coming out, she was even better. So, I think that will be a good litmus test for Jesse because obviously it's April now and the, the five star starts what July, the end of July. So it will be a good litmus test for her. It's been, you know, the same can be said for Xena as well. Um, uh, what else did you want to talk about from this match, Matt? Because obviously we are going to be talking about that Julia and Tam exchange. Um, but what else did you want to highlight before we go into that match? I just, um, the match before, well, obviously, we just talked about match four. That's match six. The match before match five with the Stars team versus the, um, what a tie team. I just want to, I mean, everybody worked really hard, but I just want to put over how great of a closing sequence with Momo Watanabe and Momo Kogo. Obviously, Momo Watanabe is one of the, the all time best at just 22, 23 years old. She's fantastic. But again, we talked about how crazy stacked the stardom roster is. And you forget how good Momo Kogu is. I'm watching this match. And I'm like, okay, I know the way Stardom builds these multi-person matches. You know the, the the way it builds psychology, who they get heat on. So you can kind of tell the finishing sequence is going to be between the two Momos. And Momo Kogu all of a sudden was decided, hey, don't forget about me. I'm fantastic as well. So I just want to just take a uh, a moment to uh, put over Momo Kogu and how great she was in that match. Um, but yeah, partner, let's get into. Jeez, uh, I, I don't. They just. I, I'm worried a little bit about Julia versus Tam because uh, they, they they need to, I, I tweeted this out a week ago. They just need to keep them away from each other because like you might lose the main event <laughs> at this point. Like, Oh man. But yeah, let's, let's get into a part let's get into the DDM versus uh cosmic angel. I guess let's talk about the bright side 
Waka gets the first win and she knows how to dance, right? Let's put that on. I here. mean, honestly, <laughs> who'd have thought that all it took was a win for Waka Sukiyama to find her dancing shoes? I mean, yes, it still looked like she was on strings at times, but she knew the moves and she looked happy. It was nice to see that side of Waka after, you know, three months or however long of just that stress and that weight on her shoulders of, you know, the impending final match. But I thought, you know, it was it was a really nice thing to see her blending back in with the Cosmic Angels style. And I must admit, we were we were a bit down last week on this the Cinderella final as a pay-per-view. Um uh, due to <sighs> well, due to its lack of star match, to be perfectly honest, if we're being brutally honest. However, what they have done is they have rebuilt this Mei Sakurai and Wakasuki armor storyline. Um, there was a great thing on Twitter which highlighted, you know, the betrayal that Waka felt when Mei Sakurai chose to go to DDM. Um, and obviously Mei Sakurai has got this sort of ladyship gimmick that she's better than everybody else, which I think is perfect for Waka Sukiyama to get the win. But irrelevant of that, I thought that exchange was a good sort of distraction from just the violence of Julia and Tam. I mean... Tam tweeted out a photo and so, someone on Discord said, has Rob recovered from seeing that photo yet? No, and I don't think I ever will. Like, we saw we saw at the press conference Julia basically bust Tam open hard away with a headbutt and I thought that was like, Jesus Christ, how'd you top that? Well, it turns out you top that by literally bludgeoning Tam until she has a second head coming out of her head. Like, if you haven't seen it, this this lump she has got on her head is grotesque. And don't get me wrong, this escalating brutality, violence, and semi-realism that these two are bringing to this feud is fantastic. It's adding such a layer of excitement towards this main event. My only concern, apart from the fact is we might lose one of them before the bloody match, um, is that We've still got just under two weeks to this match. How do you top this match without it going... Sorry, how do you top what they're doing already in the build to this match without sort of peaking excitement? Like, you don't want to go too far and then have nothing left for the match. Like, they are... Without physically stabbing one another, I don't know what else these two women are going to do to each other. Well, Tam, again, it's very rare. I mean, I mean, Rob, again, you know better than me, but I think the only other time that stardom used blood, um, other than like you know all the occasional, occasional busted lip or busted nose that happens, but was the Arisa Utami match. So you use the blood in the uh, in the press conference. Tam has a bandage on her head, and very much like Terry Funk, Abdul the Butcher, all Japan style in the early '80s. It goes right. T- Julia goes right after the bandage, right after the bandage. Like she pulls Tam hair, she starts punching her right, right, it, you know where the lump is and the, uh, you know where the where the blood is, and um, yeah, goes after it right away. And then they escalate the violence even more because then they go to the outside. Uh, Julia suplexes. Tam into the front row and then tosses her into the second row. And as Julia goes to make her way back in the ring, Tam gives Julia a belly to back suplex into the first row and then hits a violent shooting while she's in between rows one and two, sending Julia to row three. So I'm like, jeepers. But yeah, the uh, like my two, I have two concerns about this, about the match. And obviously, we'll talk more about it next week. Is uh, one is I just hope they're going to be okay and there's no major injuries. And two, it's how they literally can just copy and paste what they're doing in the press conferences and these matches leading up to it and just put it in the match and add elements of their five star match and the uh you know their white their three white belt matches and it's going to be a five star match but i'm just worried that they're going to be like no we need to top this it's the biggest match there's a dream match there's a phenomenal white belt match there's shuri versus hashimoto which is going to be violent it's micah versus himika which is going to be violent this match needs to be the most violent and I think they're going. It is going to be the most violent, 
and I'm just kind of just concerned for the both of them. Yeah, I th- look, Julia's done violence before, of course, but I think they know when to stop. Hopefully, he says without too much conviction. Um, the thing is, like, even even with Mercedes and Mayu on the card now, um, this match doesn't feel like a forced main event. Like, you don't feel like this is only the main event because it's the red belt. This is the main event because you cannot follow the level of brutality that these two are going to throw at each other. Now, I would like to see, you know, where they're going with this. I'm sure we're going to get the Julia Pile Driver spot through a table. I'm sure we're going to get that. Seems to be a favorite thing in the world. Um, I just hope that they don't peak and then run out of ideas. That's that's my only thing. Because genuinely, if they can bottle some of just the savagery that they've unleashed on each other in the last couple of weeks and just put even half of that into this match on uh, on the 23rd, I'm genuinely frightened for the people in like the first four rows. Because genuinely, they might become more, part, more a part of the match than Tam and Julia. Like, they actually might be, like, some of the weapons used, these people. Tam might just get a person by the legs and just beat Julia in the head with it. So, uh, honestly, I'm very, very excited. You know, joking aside, I do think they'll be safe. Relatively. Um, You know. They're pros. Exactly. Yeah, they're pros. Yeah, especially you look at the way that Julia, and I've said this on the podcast before, she's basically... uh, uh, Akira Hokuto. She really, I mean, they, they literally have the same finisher. Just what she's, she's literally the dangerous queen. But you see the way she does her moves, even what she beat Sherry with that hammer lock, a Northern Lights bomb. If you go, I mean, as gross as it looked when I watched it live, you go back and watch it. She was safe by the way she, that she, that she did it. So, uh, yeah, they're going to be sore, but I think, yeah, they're going to be safe. But I mean, there's literally, I, I wrote, I texted you. I said, yeah, why I was off. I wrote a whole bunch of articles and that's the one article I wrote. So I came home from the gym. I said, I'll write a little bit on Tam versus Julie and we'll we'll post it before a couple days before the, uh, the big show. And I just kept writing and writing and writing and writing. And I would have sent it to you already, but my, I, my English and and I'm not very good when it comes to like uh, punctuation and whatnot. So I gave it to my wife and Amber looked at it. She's all right, I'll, I'll, you know, I'll edit this. And then you can send it to Rob. And she goes, geez, you wrote a lot here. I said, there's a lot to write about Tam versus Julia. So I'm excited for everybody to read the posts and I'm super, super excited and a little worried uh, about this match coming up next week. Yeah. Either way, it's going to be exciting. Like what would your star rating? What would your star rating for the match? My friend, uh, three and three quarters. I had it at four stars just because of the, just between the violence between the two of them, how good the Waka and uh, May Sakurai story was. Uh, Natsu Boy was really good. And Micah was phenomenal here, but nobody's talking about it. Well, it's, <laughs> same, it's the same as Natsu Boy. Like, Natsu Boy is fantastic, but nobody's going to be talking about it because the feud between Julia and Tam just keeps escalating. I mean, to be fair, we did think that after the press conference, they wouldn't be able to top what they did. And then suddenly Tam comes out with this alien growing out of her face. So, you know, who knows what they are actually going to do at this pay-per-view. Um, all in all, it, it the Sendai show is a good show. Go and check it out. I would love to have, you know, reviewed the shows from the 8th and 9th. Obviously, at the moment, that's not possible. So we will tag that on to what will be a 15-hour extravaganza next week at the rates that we are going alongside our review of the Cinderella Tournament Vinyl and our preview to uh, All-Star Grand Cinderella. Um, looking ahead then to this weekend, Matt, um, we went through these cards uh, last week on the podcast, but we need to give our predictions to the main sort of matches on these shows. So we'll start with the Corican show on Saturday, the 14th of April. And the two main matches that we have are Azumi versus Saki Kashima for the high speed championship and my Himmy versus ALK. So let's start with that high-speed championship match. Azumi, the champion, taking on Saki Kashima, the challenger. Um, who do you see winning that? 
Real quick, I just want to say the co-main event of this show, uh, Mina versus Himika in another Himika retirement oh, yes. tour match. Is, yes, that is a must-see in the main event as well. Um, again, I know we're kind of all over the place. We're just excited. The main event of Star of uh, All of God's Eye versus pretty much all of uh, Queen's Quest was fantastic as well. Anywho, um, I, boy, I tell you what, a lot of people have Saki Cashman winning this, and I can kind of maybe see why maybe, especially after this past uh, weekend, maybe it's time to... Uh, elevate a zoomy and then maybe getting her towards a white belt and or maybe even a red boy how awesome would a zoomy versus a julia match be um boy it's a tough one it's uh, man i'm gonna say a zoomy but i would not be shocked if uh if saki gets the uh gets another fantastic um fantastic uh roll up here uh kishi kasai but i think just a zoomy coming into that big show in Yokohama with the high speed championship, considering the fact that her tag match is an unofficial high speed tag match, I think you kind of need the belt there. So I'm going to say Azumi, but I would not be shocked if we see a 45 second roll up of the Kishi Kasai and see the title change. So my big thing is now Azumi, she's held the belt in this reign for over 400 days, 411 days. She's fourth in the all-time championship reigns. She's got a long way to go to being number one. Number one, Natsukateo in a third reign, 679 days. She's already set the record for most successful title defenses at 10. Unless you are going to make her, you know, make her the number one longest single championship reign and making her beat Natsukateo, which is over 200 days away. I don't see what else Azumi has left to prove in the high-speed division. Like, she is the high-speed bomb girl. She is an incredible high-speed wrestler. But I also think she's done everything she can in this division. So, why not give the division a new champion, someone who, yes, has had the odd cup of tea in the high-speed division, but has never been a mainstay. Yet, it's always puzzled me how Saki Kashima has never been part of a high-speed division because she just, she screams high-speed with the way she wrestles. I think this would be the perfect way. Get her to roll Azumi up, and then you've got a new champion in Saki, who can then have matches with the likes of Kagome, with Momokogo, and you can start bringing in more talent into that high-speed division, and then you can start working to elevate Azumi up the card to white belt matches, to red belt matches, which we've both said she thoroughly, thoroughly deserves to be now. And I think that's the next step in Azumi's development. We know she can high-speed wrestle. But can she do a main event 25-minute match against the likes of Julia, against the likes of Asuri? She's done, you know, shorter matches against Suri. She did one for the SWA belt uh, back on Valentine's Day two years ago. She did one against um, Suri again in the, um, in the five-star. But can she do it in a sustained manner? Can she become a legitimate challenger to a title? And I feel like this is the chance now to sort of leave the high speed division, just like Starlight Kid did um, back in March. She's left that division. She said goodbye to the division. I think this is the perfect opportunity for Izumi to do the exact same thing and to begin elevating her as a credible threat to other titles higher up the card. I think Saki Kashima takes it. Well, you did say, you know, what would. Uh... Can Izumi wrestle 20, 21 minute, you know, main event match? I would love to find out, my friend. And she can do the high speed stuff, like in the beginning of the match, or like she can enter certain points of it. Like we've seen her kind of have those matches with Mike and Himika where we joke where Mike and Himika, this match was their tryout for the high speed division because <laughs> <laughs> we have high speed shoulder tackles. So she can still, I mean, we see Starlight Kid doing it. I mean, t- Azumi kind of had a high speed match with Mercedes Monet and Hazuki a little bit there. So she can still use that style but just maybe bring that style up to more of a, you know, white belt, and red belt. So, um, yeah, we'll see what happens. Obviously, if she loses here, we know that they're going to bump her up the card and rightfully so maybe even take advantage of all the positive press she had with that, you know, with the uh, Mercedes Monet match. So 
Yeah, I can I can see it happen here. Regardless, whatever they do with Izumi, it's going to be uh, no pun intended money because she is absolutely fantastic. Yeah, and that my one thing is I think if you compare Azumi and Starlight Kid, I would argue that Azumi often gets pigeonholed as the high speed person, whereas I think they've done a good job of sort of rounding out Starlight Kid. You know, we know that she is capable of having, you know, fantastic white belt matches and main event style matches, whereas we're not quite used to seeing that with Azumi because, as I mentioned, she is pigeonholed as the high speed girl. And I think until she's dropped that high speed belt, that's what she's going to be remembered for. And I think if you don't drop it to Saki, she has literally beaten everybody else. (laughs) So, you know there's got to be someone to beat Azumi and I think Saki's the perfect the perfect um, person to take the belt and then we've got what we assume is going to be the main event the last My Himi match a run back of uh, the April pardon me April 4th Goddess of Stardom Championship match from back in 2021 Micah and Himika taking on Alto Lovello Kabalawan uh, Julia and Suri reuniting for one night only um, the last match almost went to a 30-minute time limit draw. Would not surprise me in the slightest if this went to a 30-minute time limit draw. If it does go to a 30-minute time limit draw, I don't think you will find a single person inside Corrigan or watching at home that will be complaining, Matt. I think it would only be a 20-minute time limit because it's not for any championship. I think the reason why it pushed past 20 is because it was for the goddess. So uh... You've ruined it now, Matt. God damn Sorry, it. Buddy. <laughs> Sorry, my friend. I'm just trying to spit the facts here. But uh, regardless, <laughs> it'll be if they get 10 minutes, 30 minutes or three days, it's going to be absolutely fantastic. I would not be shocked if this ends in a draw. This very much is your stardom promotion. And I would not be uh, heartbroken if it does end in a draw. But I think it will end considering the fact that Mike and Himika are members of DDM. I think that you will see Himika take the fall uh, from Julia, the leader of DDM. Um, and I think what a better way to put a bow on my Himmy than having the leader of DDM and the leader of Stardom, the Red Belt Champion, to get the pinfall. But um, that's my prediction. And if you agree with me, Rob, that only means one thing. <laughs> well, yeah, absolutely. I think if there's going to be any... <laughs> Any so I mean, it would be nice to see Mike and Himika get some sort of vengeance after that match, but I mean, there's there's no point. If Himika is retiring and she is happy, then she's already proved she's more than happy to put people over. I mean, for goodness sake, on the eighth of um, on the sixth of April, she put over Mina Shirakawa, so she's clearly not bothered about putting people over. I think you know you've got Julia and Shiri. Julia, of course, who's the Red Belt champion. There is no way she is taking a pinfall. So uh, yeah, I think if anyone is winning, it's going to be ALK. Um, I'd like to see a twenty minute time limit draw. Yeah, record and clip that. Rob Goodwin would like to see a time limit draw. Um, just that's a new shirt. That's a new shirt, folks. <laughs> absolutely. Um, <laughs> Stan, don't do enough of them. Um, I just think it'd be nice to have these these four women just wrestle for twenty minutes because they're all fantastic. But I don't think it's going to happen. I think A L K are winning. Um, And then, of course, we have the Cinderella Tournament Final. Now, obviously, we're not going to go through all the six women and the ten women tags, but the most important thing here, well, several most important things, and one thing I wanted to bring up with you, actually, Matt, is we are seeing a lot of Konami on these cards recently. And I think I've brought this up with you a couple of times. She's in a singles match. Um, on that 14th of April show against Waka Tsukiyama, her first singles match in 470 days or whatever it is. Um, she was on that Sendai card. She's been on quite a few cards recently, and she's on this Cinderella tournament final card against Suri. Do you think we are in the process of seeing Konami transition back into this roster full-time? I sure hope so. We said last year during Golden Week, she looked great. She looked happy. She looked rested. She was in great shape. She looked great in the ring. 
I really, really hope so. Because you know what this roster needs, Rob? It needs more really, really good wrestlers. That's what <laughs> we need. Uh, no, obviously, I, I love Konami. She works that style that I absolutely love. That I mean, she is the submission uh, sniper. She does work the uh, you know the, the striking and the uh, the submission style, and is very good at bumping and feeding for opponents as well. So she works that style that I really, really like, and she's a perfect you know fit. I, I'm assuming if she does come back full time, I'm assuming that she's going into God's eye because we've seen her since she's been back for these, you know, matches and whatnot, teaming uh, with Shuri in the God's Eye faction, which immediately puts her to like, wait a minute, I thought you were with a way to tie, you know, so you have an immediate few there. Maybe we'll get some, you know, Momo Watanabe versus Konami matches, which, uh, yes, please sign me up. Um, but it sure looks like it. I mean, she looked really good in these multi-person matches. I still think they're going to do a Konami Julia uh, World of Stardom Championship match somewhere down the line just based on the uh, last match Julia had before she took uh, the title from Sherry that uh, Julia took a top rope German suplex. And then the two of them were at each other's throats after the match. I'm like, oh, they're finding the seeds there for something. And Stardom does really good with that. And the fact that, again, you know, you just brought it up, partner, that we're seeing some more singles matches here from Konami. So I think that she's transitioning into uh, maybe not a full-time, but maybe instead of wrestling, maybe 20, 25% of the time, maybe somewhere like a 60, 70%. Maybe they're slowly easing her in. And maybe by the end of the year, she'll be back full-time. But uh, I, and I don't think anybody will uh, be upset if Konami is back on the roster tomorrow full-time because she's terrific. I would love to see, obviously she's wrestling her mentor on this card. I think it would be a perfect chance for them I don't know, maybe to go 15 minutes, maybe end in a time limit draw. Oh my God, I'm turning into Rossi Ogawa. Um, <laughs> Are you wearing a hat I, and a monocle? Dude, too? Like, what is lovely, this? Man. <laughs> um, it wouldn't surprise me if this goes to a 15 minute time limit draw or if Konami even wins because there's no title on the line. Um, and I'm sure he's got a big match coming up though next week. That is true. That is true. And Konami isn't on that card. That is a very good point. So, I don't know. I was thinking maybe then she would, she could announce that she's coming back full time, but maybe not. Maybe not. Maybe I'm just a dreamer, Matt. Maybe. Um, but anyway, let's talk a little bit about this Cinderella tournament. So the final four, Wakasukiyama, May Sakura, and Mirai and Amisori are your final four in the 2023 um, tor- Cinderella tournament. Um it's got quite a lot of negativity, as we talked about last week. However, I think they've done extremely well to build the Wacker and May Sakurai storyline up. Um, who do you have? Let's start with Mirai versus Amisori, as I feel like this semifinal is being overlooked somewhat, and I think it could be really, really good. Um, who do you have winning that? Rob, let, I, I'm so sorry. I know I'm all, you're asking me questions and, I, and I'm hitting the rewind button. I know you have the card up there because I believe there's something very big that was, we didn't see. I mean, I thought I read it on Twitter that there's a very big match. Is there a multi-person Cosmic Angels versus DDM match that has Team Tam versus Team Julia on the, on this card on the 15th? Julia Tackler, Micah, and Himika versus Tam Nakano, Natsupoi Saki, and Mina Shirakawa. Okay, because after the uh, the match we just reviewed, that brutal, brutal time limit draw um, with uh, the Cosmic Angels team versus DDM, um, Julia said on the 15th, it's the last time we're going to meet before the Yokohama show. Let's make it, and it's the last time that Himika is going to be with uh, DDM. Let's make it two out of three falls. And then she said something along the lines of, I want to end Cosmic Angels. And I thought either the show after that or the show after that, obviously it's not uploaded on World, and I could be wrong. I thought I read something on Twitter saying that if DDM wins, Cosmic Angels disbands. And I don't want to look over that. And I'm so sorry to, uh, you know, again, once kind of, you know, throw everything off here, but that's kind of a big deal if that's what they're doing. Because we might see the end of Cosmic Angels this weekend. Hmm. It's... Let me have a look. And I, 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 and I could be wrong. I thought I read that somewhere on Twitter uh, as the shows uh, were happening or after they finished. But Julia did cut the promo. I just watched it just a few hours before we recording, saying it's going to make it two out of three falls, and she wants to end Cosmic Angels this weekend. And I could have again. I've been wrong. It will not be the first time I'm wrong today, and it won't be the last. Um, but I thought that 
it's some some sort of a stipulation stipulation excuse me that if uh team ddm wins that the cosmic angels has to disband i mean well it would certainly uh elevate things i mean yeah we, especially this yeah and we need they kind of need a boost on this card um I'll have a look and see what I can okay. find. It wouldn't surprise me. I just, yeah, I just, if that is, I just didn't want to overlook it. But to answer your question, Mariah, uh, Mar- okay, uh, Mariah vs. Omni, sorry. I can very easily go 0 for 3 on these facts I'm going to predict, and that'll fit right in line with what everybody's predicting <laughs> for this <laughs> tournament. Uh, I'm going to say that Omni, sorry, wins. I just don't think they're going to tease a back-to-back for Mirai would be the only wrestler other than Mayu to not only win the tournament twice, but win to back-to-back. But I'm going to say Omri Sori wins. Will I be shocked at all if Mirai wins? Not at all, because <laughs> two first creepers, I mean. <laughs> I mean, it's not out of the realms of possibility. She didn't beat Mirai <laughs> in the five-star, so. Ah! There we go. Good, so, uh, Josie Jams at Glorious Royals on Twitter. Great follow. Great follow. And he makes phenomenal, phenomenal videos. Literally, hours after the matches happen, they are up. I I implore everybody to follow. Great follow. Julia has challenged Tam Nakano and the Cosmic Angels to a series of three matches on April 15th. If the Cosmic Angels lose, they must disband forever. So we talked about how, oh yeah, they, they can't escalate this feud anymore. Julia could literally take Tam's entire faction away from her. I Crazy. Mean, I'm scared now (laughs) because what's Tam going to do to keep the cosmic angels together? What craziness can she do to keep the cosmic angels together? What craziness can Julie do to take the cosmic angels? Oh, by the way, then we have the red belt next week. Like, Oh my goodness. (laughs) I can see DDM winning that. Yeah. I don't know which way it's going to go. I don't have a time on the draft. There's my prediction. (laughs) I just pulled the U. I copped out. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, I'm wondering if Tam and Natsupoy, obviously their album, the Meltier album, is out soon. I wonder if they're going to have to do some sort of promotion for that. The 19th of uh, April. I don't know how I know that. <laughs> we we all know how you know that, Matt. Um, it w- do you know what? It wouldn't surprise me if DDM win and therefore Tam and Natsupoy go away for a bit, do some promotion for the Meltier album. And Wacker joins Club Venus. Uh, we shall see, sir. We shall see. Well, that has, yeah, that, that, that has certainly that added another card. wrinkle. Yeah. Sure. And uh, we said we were waiting for that sort of uh, blow-off match. It turns out we actually had it, and I just hadn't noticed. So uh, my apologies. I usually do my due diligence. That's why we're a team there, good sir. That's why we're a team. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Um, so you've got Amisori winning. I've got Amisori winning as well. The whole point of the Cinderella, it seems, from this Final Four is to elevate lesser experienced talent. And I think Mirai won it last year. Mirai is booked incredibly strongly at the moment in stardom. I think Amisori would have considerably more to to gain from going through to a final than Mirai would. Would it surprise me, like you just said, would it surprise me if Mirai got through? No, absolutely not. But either way, I'd like I'm I'm looking forward to that match as both these women, I imagine, will uh, go into it very, very hard hitting. Now the next semi-final, Wakasukiyama versus Mei Sakurai. Um my heart is telling me Waka. Because this entire Cinderella tournament seems to have been a vehicle for Waka. But do they extend that feud between Waka and May Sakurai by sort of having May win? I mean, it would get her over as a huge heel. Sure. But I feel like if you are looking for a feel-good factor at the end of this pay-per-view, the only way that you are going to get that is with Wacker stood at the end in the Cinderella dress. 
yeah, partner, and I'm. That's my. I'll give you my prediction for this match and uh, and for the final. I think that's what's going to happen. I think Waka wins here, and I think that uh, she wins the Cinderella. I mean, you think about the ultimate Cinderella story, other than like Mayu's career. And obviously, I know that early on in the podcast before I joined, uh, you've touched upon you know Mayu's career, you know everything that she went through to become a professional wrestler. Other than that, the ultimate Cinderella story in the twelve year history of stardom is this Waka story. And when you get Waka her first win, you she literally gets into the Cinderella tournament literally the last second as she's doing broadcasting. Oh, by the way, you have to wrestle. Um, and then she wins the whole tournament, especially a tournament that has a lot of us diehards scratching her head saying, why did you eliminate Saya so early, Mayu so early, Julia so early, Yutami so early, so on and so forth. I think um, that might be the whole plan from the hat man is uh, just the genius of it to give us that moment at the end where we have Waka who two months prior, we didn't even know was going to be still a part of stardom. And the fact that she wins the Cinderella tournament, I think that would be something fantastic. And I think like her, and I'm trying to think like what what her wish would be. I think her, you could do one or two, two things with her wish. She's going to wish she has an artist of stardom championship match, which then you have uh, Mina saying, we'll pick club Venus. And then you have Tam saying, no, you pick cosmic angels. So you can kind of have Mina and Tam pulling for her or Walker just being the pure soul. Her wish is world peace. So I'm just going one <laughs> or two ways with that. <laughs> Brings back DX, Triple H, Shawn Michaels. Oh, they all do the cross Break job. It. Break um, it down. <laughs> I mean, you're assuming Cosmic Angels are still a thing at that point. I don't know. I don't know what's going on. I'm just excited. <laughs> I mean, it would not surprise me if ddm are to beat cosmic angels eradicate cosmic angels and then an hour later <laughs> wacker's wacker's <laughs> wish is to bring back cosmic angels it's oh, oh my swerve. genius prince russo stroking his beard <laughs> um like I, I do think that wacker is probably winning this tournament which just for a moment think that that is what we are saying wacker sukiyama who had not won a match until May, uh, March even, sorry, May, what am I on about? March, is now the favourite in many people's eyes to go on and win the Cinderella. Imagine having someone say that in January. The Wakasuki armor is the favourite to win the Cinderella. You'd have been laughed at. Yet here we are, a week away, well, four days away as we record, from the Cinderella tournament final, and we all think that it's going to end with Wakasukiyama wearing the Cinderella dress. And it's the storyline that makes most sense. I find that baffling. But the fact that, looking back on it, a woman who lost 170 straight matches or whatever it was, winning the Cinderella doesn't seem out of the realm of possibility is a testament to the story that they did with her. Because what you do is by... You run a risk by booking what they've done with Wacker. And it could go one of two ways. I think it's helped by the fact that Wacker is such... You can't help but love Wacker Tsukiyama. You can't help but be so invested in her as a character. that And she she seems to be a genuinely nice person. It doesn't seem to be an act. I think that people were invested in her. You ran the risk of people just having complete apathy towards her because she just kept losing. And that was where I was worried we were going, if you remember, partway through last year. I was mm-hmm. worried that we'd sort of lost a lot of steam, a lot of heat to do with this. However, we've got to a point now where it's it's the most sensible story. And I think, again, you know, we criticize stardom when we feel it needs to be criticized. We build stardom up and we praise stardom when it needs to be praised. And I think the storyline with Waka is one of the great successes of stardom in 2023 is the fact that Waka Tsukiyama has gone from like wrestling bankruptcy, having never won a match, having been repeatedly downtrodden to winning one of stardom's premier tournaments 
and no one at all thinking, well, that's utterly ridiculous. You know, no one is having to suspend disbelief at that fact. And I think that that is a testament to some great storytelling and testament to Wakasuki Yama, who, in a company with Mayu Iwatani, the ultimate baby face, at the moment, it's 1A and 1B with Mayu and Waka. It's crazy. I know the uh, Stardom Twitter page, I think uh, the English Twitter page, ran a poll about a week ago between the four finalists that who do you want to see win the tournament? It was like 63% Waka. I was like, whoa, Waka Mania is running wild. It's Honestly, it's it's something that I would never have thought about. I said January, even February, or the start of March, even come the start of the tournament. I didn't think that Wakasuki Yama would be anywhere near winning it. Like, I didn't think she'd be anywhere near the final four, never mind winning it. So, you know, kudos and testaments to Stardom and to Waka, who thoroughly, thoroughly deserves it. Now, I am just looking at the moment, still announced for this Stardom Cinderella tournament, because I am, I am very much intrigued now by this Donna Del Mondo and Cosmic Angels feud. At the moment, it is still posted as an eight-woman tag match, three matches. Now, I am going to assume that that is a two out of three falls match and not three full eight-woman tag matches because one way I thought that they do it is have a series of singles matches. But why would you have Julia and Tam in a singles match? a week removed from the biggest pay-per-view that you're running in the year. So I think the chances are they're going to do a two out of three falls. I mean, that's, that's what I'm, that's what I'm gleaning from this, man. What if not support? Now, now we're overbooking. First of all, the fact that me and you both have Waka <laughs> winning the tournament, what does that tell you? Do not bet on Waka folks. Uh, anywho, um, what I'll be sorry to support? win confirmed. <laughs> What if Natsupoy turns on Tam? No, they can't because they have the album. Like yeah, she was like a mole a inside all. <laughs> yeah. All as soon as I said that, I broke my heart. I'm like, why would you even say that, Matt? What's wrong with you? Oh, I need to take a shower. I feel dirty. I don't know. I'm already overbooking it in my head. But uh, yeah, yeah. Now all of a sudden we have some really intriguing things coming out of uh, this pay per view. So again, last week we were kind of uh, we kind of a little bit down on it. But now all of a sudden, it's like this intriguing story with you have Waka and May Sakurai heating up their feud. You have the new heirs wrestling each other a week away from their their biggest, you know, they have a tag title match in the Yokohama Arena on the other side. So it's like, yeah, we don't know. I would not be shocked if any four of these ladies won the tournament. I would not be shocked at all. And then you're throwing this 10-person tag where Cosmic Angels have to split up. And we're heating up this already brutal, brutal feud up more between Tam and Julia. Yeah, now it's gotten, uh, it's gotten a little intriguing. So once again, kudos to Stardom uh, for, for kind of just 180 uh, that just from where, where, where our discussion was last week, partner. Yeah, I mean, it's going to be very, very exciting. Um, my final question in regards to this final, what goes on last? Because... I was just thinking of that. Yeah, great question. I mean... How do you follow? I mean, we are assuming here that the Cosmic Angels are going to disband. Um, how do you follow the potential of a faction disbanding? Like, admittedly, with the greatest go home of Waka Tsukiyama winning um, the Cinderella, but the thing is, like, if her faction's just been disbanded, it's a bittersweet moment, isn't it, really? So. Me- <sighs> go ahead. Do you do do you do the semifinals to open the pay per view, and then have the final as the semi main, possibly following Suri and Konami, and then have that eight woman as the main event? Because I mean, they have had moments where the Cinderella tournament final has not main evented the pay per view. I mean, it would be. <laughs> Obviously, you need the photo opportunity of standing in the dress. I feel like that would close the pay-per-view, which is going to be a little bit of a downer if Cosmic Angels are no longer a thing. Jesus. I mean, like, what would you main event this show with? 
you uh once again partner you're literally reading my mind obviously i think you do what you did two years ago where you had the cinderella finals saya beats micah and then you have that one of the best matches in the history of the company you tommy and sherry and that gives the cinderella when the cinderella winner time to get cleaned up and get the dress on um and then you get that photo opportunity but it would be kind of a downer if Waka wins the tournament and then she comes out, she's getting ready, you know, she's getting her all makeup done, she's all getting ready for the prom and whatnot, and, up by, and she sees Tam and not support crying. She's like, what's wrong? Are you guys crying because you're happy because I won the tour? I'm like, no, we're done. Go out there and get your picture, kid. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, I don't... I don't, I, I, again, I still see Waka winning. I would not be shocked if the DDM team wins, but I think just to get a little bit more, kind of maybe heat Tam up, I think the Cosmic Angels team, and I'm only going like 55 45. I think Cosmic Angels teams win because all this Julia Tam stuff, it's all, other than Tam cutting Julia's hair, it's all been Julia on top of Tam. I mean, it's her suplexing her. It's her, you know, beating her senseless. It's her blooding her. It's her, especially, you know, the show we just talked about where she busted up Tam. She threw her into the, the first row and then the second row. And then she started punching her in the head again where she almost looks like she has a hematoma on the top of her head. I think that maybe you need to heat up Tam just a little bit and maybe her saving Cosmic Angels. And Cosmic Angels is a big you have to think about this from a business aspect too, my friend. Cosmic Angels is a big money mover in merch. So it's like you really take that out just to escalate the feud. I mean, I guess technically you can disband Cosmic Angels, but you're not you're not uh, disbanding Meltier. So like you can kind of do that, but I don't know. I, I'm going to say the Cosmic Angels teams win, but I still think maybe you need to put that on Lash just to build that suspense. It's an intriguing concept. Um, and it's an intrigue. I think we've managed to uh, successfully make this pay per view more exciting than we thought it was going to be in the last uh, last podcast, Matt. So uh, well done, us, and well done, Stardom. <laughs> but with that being said, ladies and gentlemen, we are going to get out of here. Um, I just wanted to say thank you to everyone that has listened. Um, we've got so many listeners, like worldwide, that it's quite scary. Like we, you know people in lithuania mexico it's like thank you wow. thank you for uh thank you for listening to two uh to two people just uh wax lyrical about a wrestling company we really we really do appreciate it um uh, again thank you to everyone that subscribes to our pa- uh, patreon as well um in the meantime you can subscribe to the podcast wherever you get your podcasts we are everywhere if you feel like we've deserved it it would be great for you to leave us a five-star review on apple podcasts or on spotify we it massively helps the podcast out we cannot tell you how much um if you fancy becoming a patreon then of course uh, you can find our patreon at patreon.com forward slash the stardom cast don't forget may the 1st we will be completely relaunching our podcast and don't forget to check out the twitter feed for that patreon release schedule which will be pinned up there keep an eye on our socials as well for a thread for questions for carrie silkin of ring of honor and keep an eye out for future announcements regarding exciting interviews which i for one am extremely excited about just to leave you on that sort of uh, cliffhanger um you can find us on all sorts of social media at the stardom cast you can talk to me on twitter at real rob goodwin um and yeah thank you again matt if you would like to sign us off good sir and uh yeah absolutely um once again folks thank you guys so much if you guys need to get a hold of me any questions comments matt turner of on the twitter and or the instagram um try not to spoil this uh five star not five star uh cinderella final i will be away once again at catch wrestling camp and probably will not be watching it live i know usually 99 percent of the shows i watch live so please don't tweet at me and be like well i can't believe how many sorry one and they disbanded cosmic angels please don't do that uh i would really appreciate it if you <laughs> don't spoil it for me but again you need to get a hold of me matt turner of on the instagram and or the twitter Social media is not your thing. Drop me an email. The stardomcast22 at gmail.com is the best way to get a hold of me via the email. Again, folks, I echo Rob's sentiments. We cannot say thank you enough for the growth of the podcast. Really means the world to us. But like I always say, folks, just not my podcast. It's our podcast because we're all in this together and everybody's different. Everybody's special. 